Hello, everyone, and welcome to our grant writing workshop. It's put on uh, by the Quentin Center and the Tech Valley. You can see some information when you got in. But I would like to introduce Janet from Momentum, who will teach you everything you want and may not want to know about grants. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Helen. Hi, everyone, and um, first day of school. I'm really impressed that you're here at this workshop. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and what I'm going to assume is that either, uh, and I can see at least one person in the audience who I know has written grants before, um, either that you've written grant, how many of you, actually put up your hand, how many of you have actually written a grant before? Two, three, four. So uh, half and half. So either you want to know um, sort of touch up skills for, for writing grants or you want to understand the universe of what grant writing is all about. So you're gonna get a bit of both. I, I know that at least one of you who has written grants before is really good at it. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna be able to add to her skills. But um, but um, I am from a company called Momentum. We used to be known as the Grant Farm because we started off writing grants uh, at this level anyway. Um, during the recession, when there was a whole bunch of money being um, Lots and it's still being handed out for things like um, for innovation and technology and electric vehicles and so on and so forth. And we knew that this money was coming down the pipe from the federal government, and we decided that we should form a, a company to be, to take advantage of this and help people get the money. And um, we've since diversified a lot from just simply grant writing, and um, we do a lot of fund development and strategic planning for people because we realized that. People weren't ready, they didn't understand what it was that they needed to get ready for grant writing and, and that there was so much more involved than just simply grant writing. So it goes whoa, slowly forward. So currently what we do is we partner with innovators and organizations, um, mainly in the um, advanced energy, uh, transportation and manufacturing um, industry. And we really try, it's a, a funny sentence that, but we really try to, assist them in getting resources and that takes a whole load more than just writing grants but what we're going to concentrate on today is is the grant writing piece very briefly you'll see millions of dollars here um oh this is a different okay um we've worked with uh, csu fresno for example and helped you with about 3.8 million dollars worth of grants we tend to talk in millions these days you know anything between sort of one and 75 million at the sort of grants we write. And these are mostly um, transportation related, but CalSeed is a program that uh, I, some of you will know about. We've got 50 million for that, and there's another thing called CalTestBed, which we've got lots of money for as well. So it's big money. And the moral of the story of that slide is that there is a lot of money that is available for grants especially in this sort of innovation energy field. And there's also, these are mainly things from the Department of Environment, um, Department of Energy Federal and the California Energy Commission. But there's also a lot of money um, with the Department of Water Resources, with CAL FIRE, um, lots of money coming down in, in California from, um, from the cap and trade funds. It's, it's a huge pot of money, and California is spending it in many different ways. So, into to grant writing, um, a typical pr proposal includes all these dots. Um, there's an executive summary, project description, rationale. You know, these are the usual sorts of things you're asked for. A scope of work. You know, you're going to have to have quantifiable goals and objectives. You know, obvious stuff like a schedule, and um, what it doesn't say out there is a budget. And um, you're going to what what you're trying to do with all these pieces is show them what you're going to be doing is showing the grantor that you have thought of everything, that you've put together a great team, that you know exactly how much you're going to have to, to need in terms of money, that you know who is the team, you've thought of permits, you've thought of all this stuff and you express it in a very clear way. Um, you're gonna get a copy of the PowerPoint um, and there's a handout here that will actually add to, to what you've got, in, what you're gonna get from this PowerPoint. 
but essentially there are all these pieces and a lot of people freak out when they realize how many pieces they need to submit. And this is minimal. I mean, there are some with, um, especially federal ones, there's all sorts of forms like uh, whether or not you've actually been contracting with R4. I mean, there are things that you was like, what am I doing with this? And um, whether or not you are contracting, if part of your team is, um, is a person with disabilities or a woman-owned business. I mean, there are all sorts of pieces that you have to look for very carefully when you're looking for grant opportunity. And in fact, I'll stop here to say that you really do need to vet anything that you see, you need to vet it very carefully to see if you can fulfill all the pieces. Um, you know, whether or not you can even submit on time, whether or not you'd be able to actually fulfill the grant by the end, by the time that they want it to fulfill, you know, Things that I deal with are like 100, they can be about 150 pages long. And you need to read every single word, probably three times with a highlighter, making big question marks all over the place before you even start. Um, there's usually a Q&A, um, you're able to write in to an agency and ask them questions. And sometimes you can, if you're very lucky, actually phone in and answer a question. And you need to be checking the questions and answers on their website every day to see what the, the what other people are asking. And usually I look at those and go, oh, come on, why are you asking that question? But in those, you know, 100 questions that, is, uh, that are asked, there are going to be some where you go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So you need to be very, very careful and very, very specific. I am not a detail-oriented person, and it has taught me to be a very, very detail-oriented or, or, um, person because... A lot of grants, especially with the CEC, the California Energy Commission, they'll tell who's passed and won the money. Then they'll say who just didn't score enough because they'll tell you who scores. And then there's this horrific list of disqualified grants. And you never want to be on that. And the disqualified grant is because you didn't put in everybody's bios or you didn't have the margins exactly right or whatever it is that they can find to throw you out on. It's one of the most terrifying moments of my life is when they say oh read who has won this this uh, funding opportunity yes, we've just released the the uh, app of, you know the, the, the awards and you i mean i i can't tell you it takes me sometimes you know 15 minutes to bear to be able to press um, and open the document up because i'm so scared of being disqualified so that's the sort of level of horror that you have to deal with when writing grants um, to the next slide. So what I'm going to talk to you about is all these things, and we'll come to them all. I won't read through them, but um, these are 10 pieces. They're not replicated in the handout, but the handout adds, is, is additive to this presentation. Some of it is overlap, but not, not much of it. So we're going to be talking about all these things, and I'm going to skip on. because And do stop. If you have questions, first of all, if you have questions and you're actually watching the webinar, you can write in. Where, where do they write in a question? They would write it in. Anything. It's no, obvious. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's obvious where you write in apparently. And if and and put your hand up if you want to ask a question during the presentation, and we'll have question and answers at the end as well. So understanding your funding partner number one, um, really and truly. Um, I don't know what I've done with my notes. They're not here. Oh well, no notes. Um, Hold on one sec, there they are. Um, the interesting piece when you get a, a funding opportunity through that you think might fit is you need to do a bit of background um, and do it before there's a funding opportunity even. It's really worth reading the California Energy Commission, for example, their strategic plan. You need to know what they're, what they're looking for because they're not looking for anything that doesn't help their goals. There's no way they're gonna fund anything, even if you think, oh, this might be a fit. They're not gonna fund you if it doesn't serve their purposes. They are handing out money to forward their goals. So you always need to read their funding and investment plans or strategic plans or whatever it is. So if you're looking around you know, for a, a client or someone to look for, whether or not their project fits, or that their, their idea fits a, a specific agency. Read the strategic plan in advance. Um, most state agencies 
funding agencies do have strategic investment plans and it's worth looking at them and it's worth looking at them even if you haven't in advance and there's a, a funding opportunity comes up read the strategic investment plan as part of your your background research um, this piece request prior successful proposals i don't think a lot of people realize that they can ask the funding agency for you know the last round let's say because a lot of things are cyclical and they have them at least once a year ask them and they will send you them um, other people's proposals that won. And this is the most instructive thing, and it's ever. I have written grants like, oh my gosh, this is so brilliant, you know, that somebody else wrote. And I, you know, you can steal totally from them. It's public information. Um, it's nothing, you know, it's public money that's, that's being handed out. It's public information. It's possibly, it's one of the top five things I'm telling you today. Ask them for prior proposals and it honestly it's like the head you know like the sky opening with you know celestial music when you actually read these things it's it's seriously helpful um participate in workshops a lot of the time you can go on a webinar um and see you know when they're explaining a funding opportunity but if you can be in person there it really really helps first of all you see everybody else who's interested in the room and some of the time, you won't necessarily, or your client won't necessarily be the applicant. You might find someone in the room who is a much bigger um, sort of partner, and you have a particular piece of, of the grant. You can bring a particular skill to it or a technology to the grant, but it's really useful to see who else is in the room, who will be, you'll be competing with, who you could partner with. And it's useful beyond words to introduce yourself to the agency. You do not, um, you don't want the first time they hear about you to be your grant proposal. You want them to know about you in advance. And you also want them to be expecting a dynamic proposal from you. It's like, oh yeah, that's the guy I spoke to. You, know, you want them there to be saying, oh yeah, that's the guy who explained his, his idea to me. I'm really looking forward to that proposal. You don't want this thing to come out of the blue from someone they don't know. So the more you can introduce yourselves and your technology or your business or whatever it is, your idea, to them in advance, um, the better. You can phone them, you can go, they are public servants, you can go with your idea to them and you can ask them for an audience or whatever, you know, interview. Before there is even a funding opportunity. We do this all the time. We socialize our clients' projects in Sacramento and telling them what, what, what we have, basically. And it's very, very useful to do. Obviously, um, you need to communicate a, a powerful story. I mean, if, you, if you're not telling them a good story, they're not gonna be excited. And what you're doing, at, the reviewers have to get excited and understand your project. And then they have to excite their superiors. They have to justify um, everything that they that they are um, saying they should fund. If they're saying, yeah, we should fund this one, it fits the bill, it, it you know, scores lots of points, it really helps if they can be excited about it at the same time as you. Um, you need to speak their language. One really clear thing is that not it's not always um, that you have subject matter experts that understand the technology, for example, that you are promoting and that you're writing about. You need to write it in a techie way, but so that normal people can understand it. It's terribly, terribly important. And people get very, very bound up in sounding super clever. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work because sometimes people, I mean, I read people's I work with technical writers and I can sometimes say, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what this grant is, you know, what you're applying for. And you do not want any reviewer to, to be looking at that and saying, I have no idea what it is. Um, so you need to speak their language. It's, it's a delicate balance between being, um, you know, between writing simply and actually explaining what might really be a new technology or a new idea. So it's, it's but do bear in mind, what we suggest in the, in the handout is, is get it reviewed by different people. You'll get your writing reviewed by different people. Hand it to someone. I mean, I, I worked recently, for example, with, um, who knows what it was about? I have no idea what it was about. It was the, 
the national labs and um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and another one, Sandia, writing writing the tech stuff. But it was so clear that I actually went, oh, okay, if I really gave it some, some thought, I could understand it. You, you know, the way they'd laid it out, I, I got it. it. I can't tell you now what it was about, but at that point when I was reading it, it was like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Um, and they were very, very clear. And you do basic stuff. Um, you address the five, five W's, you know, the who, what, when, where. I mean, I've got an example here, um, who, recology, in partnership with the city and county of San Francisco, organic waste systems, performance mechanical contractors, and Jepson Prairie Organic. For what is proposed to construct and operate the Hay Road Digester, a state-of-the-art anaerobic digester, where at its Hay Road facility um, in Vacaville, California. And then there's a, a why and a, and a what. Um, just be very, very clear. You don't have to, I don't know whether it's the same here, but I come, from England, and there's a hideous um, academic way of writing where the longer your sentence is, people think the cleverer they sound. And I have to tell you, short sentences, you know, you can have who, what, where, when, and why. You can split things up to make it really, really clear. Um, and I strongly suggest that. If you have any sentences with more than one clause in it, Start putting in periods. It makes it much, much simpler for people. Big sentences, long sentences, I have discovered after a million years of not being in England. Big sentences, long sentences do not um, make you smarter. They make you more obscure. So that's a, a tip. Um, and when you're talking about story, make sure that this actually supports your client or your strategic plan. Um, I have seen more people go after money than go after what's sensible for their business and it doesn't work. It takes you off into congenial ways and, and it doesn't work. You need to make sure that you know, what you're writing for is really what you want to do because these things take a lot of time to, to put together and you don't want to waste your time if it's not spot on for your organization and also for the agency. Oh. I've got build phase products there. This is a really cool idea and it, is, it actually simplifies things for people. People think they have to write a project, the whole thing from beginning to end, you know, their, their, their long vision. And really and truly writing it in phases is a very, very much more sensible idea. First of all, it allows you to take up bite, you know, bites of your project, get it funded, and then you've also got the agency on a hook for phase two and phase three. You know, if you're writing for phase one, you can actually achieve that. It's really achievable. And you can tell the story of what you're going to do in phase two. And then you can apply for phase two. And they'll already have been hooked in on phase one. And they, they will know that you've performed well. And they'll want to fund phase two. So you never have to put the whole project into a grant. You can take off chunks. And it, it gives people a huge sigh of relief when they realize they can do that. So the next thing, and this is also, you know, this is sort of like ask for other people's proposals. There is usually a score sheet in, um, or, or an explanation of how you're going to get points. After I've read the first, you know, the preamble and basically understand that my client is, is right for this, I will skip to the scoring criteria and make absolutely sure that we can score maximum points. Um, I was involved in one a few years ago, and it was a very big grant, six million bucks for, it was an odd, it was an, a, a CEC thing about publicizing actually all the things that the CEC <coughs> had done. And we sat there and we went, look, everybody's going to score well on partnerships. Everyone's going to score well on their, you know, their plan. You know, where are the, where's the, where's the points? And we realized that for one reason or another, the points were all in the budget, that you scored more if you were the least high budget. Um, and so we worked very, very hard on making that budget realistic, but low. And there were some extra points that you could get for having um, certain sorts of firms working for you, um, disabled veterans and so on and so forth. 
and like, okay, this is what we're going to go for. Everybody else is going to score well on the other things. This is where we have to make. This is where we have to make the points, and we want it actually. And it's it's very very important not to disregard the score sheet. You have to you have to write to the score sheet. Um, follow you stop. Follow this. I'm, I've got some score sheets coming actually. But find out where the extra points are. There's usually extra points these days for disadvantaged communities. There can be, um, there should be a match, the next bullet should be match money. Sometimes you score more if you bring more match funding to, to a grant. And um, sometimes there are extra points for partnerships with economic development, job training organization, or the California Conservation Corps. And um, sometimes there are extra points for communicating with tribes. Um, and I'm not absolutely sure what the direct versus indirect budget is, but I think that, so I'm going to, I don't know why it's there. Um, but anyway, you can sometimes get money because your budget is the lowest. Um, and again, as, as I say, if you have matching funds, sometimes the more match you bring, the more points you get. Excuse me, can I ask you, does it impact the grant if you're actually writing grants for not just one group, but for to other groups to possibly cover some of the same costs you're asking for in the first grant? So let's say I'm writing a grant to Cal EPA, and then another one, I don't know, uh, to the Department of Forestry. Yet they're going to be, the, the requests are going to be, because grants take a while to fund. Right. The, request, the requests are gonna both essentially cover most of the same thing. So now one says, yes, I'll give you five, the other one says, I'll give you three. What do you do? Um, you have to be totally upfront with them. I mean, do you need eight or do you need five? Yes. Well, that's, who you knows? It's I mean, theoretical at this point, but the, the question it's is not do? It's not unusual to write, to be totally, up, to, to write to, to many for, for one. But ultimately, you're going to, you have to tell them that you've got, well, or you have to make a decision. I'm going to take the five over the three. Or do they ever come back and say, well, we'll give you three, get another three from them, much like a, a matching fund. Well, what you can also do is, well, you can say, okay, we apply to you for three. In fact, we got another five from them. We're going to expand the project. Is it okay if we change our scope of work to do more work and see what they say? I mean, it's going to be, you can't double dip. I understand that. That's yeah. Why yeah, but you can go back to them. Would you agree, <clears throat> Hella and um, Kate? You know, you'd go back to them and say, hey, we applied at the same time. We now have lots of money. And can we keep your money and we keep your money, but do more work of the same sort? And some of it could also be if there is an requirement for match. Let's say you apply for five million, but you have to find two and a half yourself because it's a 50-50 match. You can maybe use that other portion as a match for That's that grant. Saying. Yeah. Sometimes you need to get approval for that as well. But once you have the grant, that's a conversation you can have with them. Okay, so what I understand that is you may be able to use a secondary grant resource as your, your full resource of matching funds. Yes. Sometimes you can, it, not from the same agency. Yeah. And, um, and usually not, you can't take state money, or, uh, federal money and match with other federal money. No. So, and uh, federal, some federal, federal, state to federal. State yeah, to federal you can do. Yeah, and yeah. federal to state. Yeah. But yeah, but you won't be able to use state to state, federal to federal generally. Yeah, but, but and then the other thing, as I say, sometimes, you just expand the project. You know, if it wasn't, if you had match anyway, um, you don't need to use that other three million as match. You know, you could ask them, well, can we do more? And you can always say we don't need your money. Completely. You can always, yeah. And that actually does happen. I've, I've seen a lot of CEC grants revise who they award to because somebody's dropped out for some reason. Either they got money from somewhere else, you know, right. it does happen. Um, so, Please, please, please. I mean, I think, you know, following the, the point thing, I, I write a lot of environmental grants as well as energy grants. And I reckon that I could pave over a meadow and still win if I obey the points. You know, I've said, you know, it's like, look, we could pave over a meadow. If it fits the points criteria, they're gonna have to give us the points. So, I mean, I'm not gonna pave over a meadow, but you, you know, you gotta keep to the points. Um, this is what one of them looks like, um, right, for extra points. They're going to, I mean, essentially, you don't even look at the 90 to zero. You've got to be in the 100%. That's what you're looking for. I never even bothered to look at the others. 
you want to be absolutely in a hundred percent um place and some this is all right so this is um what you're going to get so the applicant qualifications that's going to be you know have you done work before are they experienced do they actually you know have they been in existence for so, so long or whatever it is project team capabilities and that's going to be the bios and what people have done you've got to look good and there was one grant years and years ago it was a local person who just wanted my advice and he's you know he showed me this grant application for a lot of money for um gigabyte stuff rural wireless connection and he had this organizational chart that was him and one other and it was a five million dollar grant and it, you can't do, no you, they're not going to give you and your partner at ultimately five million bucks you've got to dress it up um well quite rightly i mean it, and in fact they eventually did get a grant because they did dress it up and it, they couldn't spend the money they had to it, it was a disaster <laughs> so you have to have a team that really that really looks like they can do the job. Um, you've got to have project objectives and work plan. You know, I always go for the where do we get the most points? Okay, fifteen project objectives and work plan, ten for the budget. Um, and let me tell you, if you've got a, a task in your work plan or your scope of work, you need to have an item in your budget that matches it. You have to, and you have to have a schedule item that matches it. You don't want any disparity between the scope of work, the schedule, and the budget. They have to match. If you say, we are going to build this biodigester um, in you know, March 19, you know, 2019, and you don't have a budget thing saying, but you know, that digester building $5 million, I mean, it would be broken down, but. And if you don't have um, a scope of an, a task in your scope of work saying build digester, you're doomed. You have to show absolute, um, they, they all have to match, basically. I got a question on that. Yeah. What type of people are reviewing this form? I mean, what are their qualifications? What, I mean, you, you say that nothing gets past them. Who are the them? What are they? Why? Well, actually, it's sort What's of, their it, it, generally speaking, they're a subject matter. Um, experts reading reading your grant. I mean, you recently put in this complicated DOE, the Department of Energy thing, and they came back in the Department of Energy, federal, they come back with tons of questions. They are, you, you know, there's a period where you have to get back answers to their, to their grants, the answers to their questions in, within two weeks. And they were like, very hard questions. The California Energy Commission is not quite so rigorous, but they have a panel Generally speaking, state agencies have panels of subject matter experts. I mean, I don't know with the environmental side, let's say the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and tree, you know, like tree thinning, you know, forest management type grants. They have forest, you know, forest experts, you know, registered professional foresters. They have subject matter experts reading. So, you, yes, it's not some, you know, person who's a, just a, a project manager at the CEC. They'll have subject matter experts. Yeah, and certainly at the federal level, recently they've had very, very knowledgeable people. And for small business, the small business um, SBIR grants, uh, you basically have to apply in a subject matter. And a, you have a pre-application, and so they then know if, you, if they accept you in the pre-app, they have the sub, they, that's when they hire their subject matter experts. They say, oh, we've got one for air management, we've got one for this, one for that. And, that's their trigger, the ones that they accept, is their trigger to get subject matter experts. So, yeah, you need to, you need to be good, basically. Um, a lot of, this, this is potential emission reduction benefits, that's a big one for CDC grants. Um, sometimes there's cost effectiveness. Vehicle daily range is just, it's just it's, this is taken out of a, um, an electric vehicle uh, grant. Uh, technology and innovation is sometimes there. You know, how, how innovative is this? And, and that's increasingly in grants, actually. It's interesting. Um, and commercialization. How is this technology, if it is um, a new technology, what is your commercialization plan? You have, yes, yes, you're, you're making some new air conditioner thing that's great, but how are you going to sell it? 
who are you going to sell it to? Um, application completeness, this is the hideous one where, you know, it's only five points, but this is where you get disqualified um, a lot of the time. There, there'll be these series of questions. Did they do this? Did they do that? Did they do the other? It's, you need to make sure that that's done. And timeline for project completion. These are the, the, this is a throwaway one. You know, did you read the, the funding announcement sufficiently to know that September 2022 is when the funding stops? Oh no, your schedule says it's going to end in February 2023. You're out. I mean, I, you know, you'll lose five points, but they're not going to look very kindly on you. And that's another thing. You don't want any red flags for them. You know, you need to make sure everything adds up. You need to make sure that there's nothing in there that makes them think, oh, they added the budget up wrong. What else did they do wrong? You, no red flags of that nature. So collaboration, and these are just some of the people that we put together with each other. Um, collaboration is really important. And it took 20 years ago, I was um, a director of a, an environmental nonprofit. And I would keep all my grant applications to myself. It was a olden day thinking, you know, it was like ancient people thinking, and because I didn't want to share it. And in fact, collaboration with partners to bring expertise to your grants makes a huge difference. And yes, maybe you're going to have to give away 500,000 to someone or another out of the $5 million grant, but it's worth it if they bring your team up in elevation. You know, I, as I say, I just worked with them. Um, a, a private company, but the partners were the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Sandia National Lab. And that immediately elevates them to, you know, a high, high status. If it had just been them with their own chemists trying to explain this thing, it would not have gotten anywhere, quite frankly. So collaboration is very important and searching out partners who will work with you is very, very important. Um, and this is socializing your project. I talked a, a, a bit about this. Um, momentum Media forget, that's, that's us, we help with that, but you know, I'm not pushing that. So even before there's a funding opportunity, this socialization piece is very important. You, want, you don't want, when, you're, when the funding opportunity comes out, you don't want to immediately be going to your, all of a sudden, going to elected officials who you want a letter of support from or whatever saying, hey, I've got this great idea, you know that you know, new industrial site, I'm part of it, and I want you to write me a letter in the next two weeks, a letter of support. You don't want that to happen because they're not going to do it. Even if you write them a template, they're not going to do it because they don't know who the hell you are. So early in the, in the game, early, when you've got a great project, you need to be going to your elected officials and you can go to your, as far up as your senator, and why not? Tell them about, about this great idea that you've got. Um, it's very important that people know what you're doing. Go to the Chamber of Commerce, go to local NGOs, um, tell people about your project. It's worth investing money, in, if time and, and money in that. Um, and, and create a decent presentation. We create presentations constantly for our clients to go around um, and show. Before a funding opportunity is out, we'll go to the CEC with our clients and say, this is what they're doing, and we think you should know about it. Do it in advance. Um, and you know, if there's, uh, you know, if you've got, if you're, for example, doing something that affects air quality, tell the local people about it. Tell, um, you know, any local community organisations about what you're doing. It's very, very important because when you do want their support, and we'll come to letter support, support, I think, but. When you need letters of support, and you know, I've worked with Kate and CSU Fresno, we've, we've put in 50 letters of support to some grants. And you need to know that that's the standard by which other people are writing grants. We have 50 letters of support. I think from the most recent incubator one, accelerator one, we got letters from potential users of the thing, we got letters from legislators, county people banking people, I mean, all sorts of people, um, and 50 of them. So know that, that, that people are doing that when you're writing a grant. Sometimes, I, I mean, I did one recently that I never thought was going to win. It was about, you know, taking things like walnut shells and making them into energy. It, and that was fine. It was just, it was put together very, very 
very late in the day and was like, oh God, this is never going to win. And, it. and we only had sort of four sort of fairly pathetic letters of support. And I was like, oh, never going to do it. And they did win, they, they scored high, but I'm assuming that other people just didn't write well enough or that we wrote really well and they ignored the fact that we didn't have very much support, but it, it can be up 50 plus. So just know that that's what's happening or going well. And then you need to make sure you're ready. I cannot tell you the amount of grants that I have said, okay, what is your permitting? You know, have you got permits? And people go, uh, no. And you have to be on top of permitting way in advance of knowing that you're going to be funded or not, you know, that you're going to be applying for funding. You need to know about whether or not you're going to need a, some sort of CEQA declaration of some sort. You're going to need to know what you need an air permit, water permits. You need to know this stuff. It is not possible to do it when you know what the funding opportunity is. You have to at least thought through the timing. A lot of the time now, they will want you to have CEQA done um, or very much in the bank um, by the time they um, announce the funding award. They'll give you a date. They want it done. And that definitely goes for environmental things. Um, I think the CDC more and more is saying we need to know about CEQA by the time, certainly by the time the money is awarded, not necessarily the announcement, but by the time the money is awarded. Um, we want to know about you need to know whether you do have matching funds and because you're going to have, in general, you're gonna to have to have a letter from whoever is providing matching funds, whether it's you know, the Department of Energy or the California Energy Commission or some big donor or whatever it is, you're gonna to have to have a letter saying, letter committing the funds. Can a, uh, <clears throat> can a real estate asset be used as matching funds? Sometimes, not necessarily. That's part of vetting the whole grant and reading every line. I think there was one where we were working with Fresno where we were gonna count buildings. And all of a sudden I remember saying, um, nah, you can't count the building, see page 55, you know, bullet three. So you need to know, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It's very important to see what match you are allowed. Very important. Um, site control is another. I know people who have written grants and they haven't asked the owner of the property whether or not they can actually do this thing on their land. I mean, it's happened. And um, then they go to the people, to, to the owner and go, hey, we've got this money to do this thing on your land. And they go, uh, no. So you have to have site control. And a lot of the time now, you're gonna need a letter from whoever the landowner is, if it isn't you, saying, Yes, they have my full permission to do this thing on my land. So that's your landlord, private landowner, that you just fancy doing some work on their land. But it's not, you can't just fancy doing some work on their land. You need to know that you're going to have to have their, their permission. And I would fully vet the team. Um, you need to, um, you need to know who's on your team in advance. A lot of the time I work with people who go, uh, well, I'll send you the names of the people at some point or another and it's like three days before and you need bios of all these people or their resumes and then they send you their resumes in PDF form and you can't put them, make them two pages long, which is what the requirement is and uh, You know, so you need you need to get this stuff and you can get this stuff very very much done in advance You need to because you can't do it if there's six weeks only to go before the due date of the grant. I hope I'm freaking you all out <laughs> because it's not easy and you need to be on top of it when you're going to be doing this. If you're asking someone for a million dollars or five million dollars, you need to be rigorous for good reason. You know, five million bucks is a lot to give to someone and you need to show you're worth it. So a lot of the time, and this is especially true in California, not for the, probably not for the Department of Energy and Federal, but um, in California, most of the time now, most grants want to know about your um, involvement with the disadvantaged community. Is this project in a disadvantaged community? Have you involved the disadvantaged community in the planning of this project? Um, are you committed to hiring employees from, from within the disadvantaged community? Um, all sorts of things that you're gonna have to do to show that you are 
committed to bringing up a disadvantaged community. And, you know, we have lists of ways to do it and things that we advise our clients to do and be inventive, but you can't buy. You can't say, yeah, we talked to five community groups. I, or you can't pretend. They've seen, they've seen every single possible pretend way of, invo of involving a disadvantaged community. It has to be real. And you really do have to involve a disadvantaged community if you say you are. The other thing is you sometimes, quite a lot of the time now, get more points for involving a disadvantaged community. So this is something that you need to start doing in advance of any granting opportunity. You need to see where your, your, um, where your project is based. You need to see whether you can involve disadvantaged communities in any way, even if you're not based in one. Um, it's very, very important, and you're going to get more points for it, but for good reason. What yeah. is WIB on your slide? Uh, Workforce Investment Board. Uh, and they're, they're very, very useful to go to because they will help you in the job, job training centers. Make a relationship with them before the last minute. And that, you know, this is a big recurring theme. Don't think you can do everything when you get the funding announcement. Work in advance of this. And it's a part of doing good business anyway. And um, it's part of, part of building a decent project is doing all this stuff. Is that state or federal? Uh, Workforce Investment Board? Yeah. Oh, what is it? Uh, I think it's, what is it? Federal? Yeah. It's federal. Yeah. Oh, counties, counties. It's, it's, the money it's, flows in from the feds to the counties. counties. Yeah, so it's the same sort of thing, but it's the counties, I think. Um, so anyway, yes. Talk to them tomorrow, you, you know, talk to them. And so here is this thing about a scope of work. And I remember going to a client a long time ago um, and it's like, okay, so what happened? She wanted to take down a dam and the, the little peach, an outdated peachy new thing. And they'd already taken one dam in their forest or whatever it was on the river. And I said, well, okay, how does, how does, how does this work? How do you, you know, I'm trying to, what are the steps to taking this down? Should, I don't know, we hire the guy who takes the down. It's like, okay, nobody's gonna give you a quarter of a million dollars if we say step one, hire guy, step two, guy <laughs> takes stand down. It's, you know, like, how do you get a rocket to the moon? I mean, I reckon I could now write a theoretical scope of work for getting a rocket to the moon. Because it's, it's one of these fun things, like actually, how do you take a dam down? How do, you know, what are the steps? In terms of the dam being taken down, you know, like, how do you stage it? How do you get the equipment in? How do you take, you know, where does the dam go? You know, how do you take it out? I mean, all these steps, you have to show them in all these steps that you know absolutely how your biodigester is gonna get built, how you're gonna replace this machinery. You're gonna to have to, every single step of the way from administration onwards. So, you, and you can write your scope and budget prior to any um, grant application that comes out anything. You should know what your steps are and you should know what the budget is for that and more or less how long it takes so that you can fit it into anybody's schedule. I talked about phasing. It makes your life way, way simpler if you phase your project. Um, in terms of a scope of work, I've been guilty of this, of having a million tasks under each major task. Um, you don't do that because a lot of the time your scope and your budget actually become your contract. We've done that, haven't we, Kate? We should never do that. Make it as simple as humanly possible so that, once. sorry, what? You learn that lesson once. You do. Um, we thought it made us look good, but in fact, it made us very complicated. <laughs> and she's dealing with that now. They pin the, con the scope of work and budget with some minor changes, maybe, but not many, onto the contract that you have signed so you need to know when you're writing your scope of work that this could be what you're committed to doing when you get awarded the money. It's very important to look at it through that lens, not the lens of what the reviewer is, you know, you've got to see what the, the reviewer is looking at. You've got to look at it through your own personal, you know, your department lens of, can we do this thing? Um, be aware of funding restrictions. That's talking to the piece about what, you know, what match can you use, what can, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Oh, oh, we can't put travel in here, we can't put food in here, that sort of thing. It's very important to note. Increasingly, they're taking travel out, 
food hasn't been in for a long time. Um, I used to, when I was the director of this organization, we used to like putting parties on, you know, celebrations. You can't ask for the food money nowadays. We used to be able to. Yeah. How do you write food into these grants sometimes without saying it's food? What are books have you used? I can't tell you. Well, I mean, I'm just asking because I, you know, I did a grant the other day and where they were, we were trying to have water and light refreshments for the students, but it was just how you wrote it in there. Well, you know, I suppose you could add an hour or two of staff time somewhere, you know, it, when you're actually asking, you know, invoicing the state. I didn't tell you that. Okay. But, you know, there are ways of doing it. Creative. But nothing that you, you know, you, you have to provide invoices for everything you, you buy or you're asking for reimbursement for. So staff time is sometimes a bit squishy, but I didn't tell you that. Thank you. Yeah. What did you say? People who've done this sort of thing. I mean, yeah, it, it's difficult because if you have to give an invoice and it's yeah, that's, item, that's very difficult, but you're right. You can probably use funds for somewhere else that then pays for the food, but then this grant pays for time. Yeah. yeah. It's typically the federal grants that I learned that problem is like, you know, I don't have other funds to pay for the like refreshments for kids. Yeah, exactly. It's difficult. Yeah, it is. And you know, sometimes in fact for celebrations, I've gone to local businesses and said, Hey, you know, we've bought this benefit to the community. Can you sponsor it? And your name will be up there on this celebration. You're right about that. You know, so that's a good way of doing it too. Um, so I've talked about this, the, the scope of work and budget become the basis for the contract and you really need, need to be aware of that. Um, so then an, an important thing that people don't understand is that you have to perform after you've won a grant, you have to perform really, really well. Um, because if you're rubbish and you don't ever put a progress report in on time, mm -hmm. and they say every month by the 10th, if you don't do that, and if you don't put in invoices and you don't put deliverables in and you don't actually do things on time, then they're gonna know. They're not gonna wanna deal with you again. I mean, they can't throw you out if you really score high, score high on the next grant, but they're not gonna help. They're not gonna really push you. Uh, push for you to do it again. I mean, I've worked for a government agency and I remember the conversations like, oh God, they're nightmares. Those people will never do their, their work right. And it, it, people know that at the agencies. So you've got to do, manage your projects professionally and stay in communication with the contract manager. I mean, I'll give you an example for right now that I was just talking about two days ago. I have, we have a, a client who's got lots of partners and they're depending on their partners who said it when, when the grant was written that they were going to be able to bring in match a large sum of match like 10 million bucks now that they've awarded the grant it's getting more and more difficult and the scope of the grant has changed and we're having a large discussion about where the match is going to come from and whether or not this is actually ever going to happen and i'm in a bind because i'm managing the, the, the sort of the grant for the, not the work but the relationship with the california energy commission and I'm saying to them on the telephone, guys, we've got to tell them the truth here. You know, we've got to either sign it and then, you know, deal with the truth after you've signed it or deal with the truth before you sign it. But you've got to, I need to stay in con communication with the contract manager and tell them what is going on and let things lie as they might, you know, might turn out. But you've got to, you've got to stay in communication constantly with them. They don't like not hearing from you. And um, you've got to do timely monthly reports and deliverables. I've already talked about that. You've got to do it. You've got to perform really well um, and assume an audit. One of the things, if you do win a grant, one of the things you can do is say, have you got any audit rules? So that you can set up your, your record keeping immediately so that you will be audit proof. So that you have everything for an audit. There is nothing worse, and I've seen this with very inexperienced nonprofits that win grants, they are nowhere near ready for an audit. And it's horrific when it happens. And a lot of the time they're asked for money back, which is the worst possible thing. So assume an audit and ask for their audit rules. Um, celebrate your success. We talked about that with regard to food, but um, that's really cool when you can call county officials in, state officials in, you know, clean air group or whatever it is into to celebrate a success always highlight your funding partner when you do that. If you're going to be having a party without 
then paying for food, you need to invite the California Energy Commission if they were the funding partner. They love it, totally love it. Because it shows, you know, it shows where your tax dollars are going, basically, and, and what a good job they've done. And so you need to be ready and waiting for funding opportunities. You need to structure your organization for success. You need to have partners. You need to have, know your scope and your budget. You need to know your permitting. You need to know this stuff before it all, before the funding opportunity is there. Um, always recycle a grant. If you don't win, um, do not put it, do not forget it. I work with, I still work um, with the organization that I was the director of. I still write grants for them. And I think I'm the only person that really understands what we've got in the grants that we've written. There's a ton of stuff. Don't rewrite good things. Um, don't forget it. It's there and people should know about it. If you don't get, if you don't win, one of the most important things you should do is request a debrief. Why didn't you win? Ask for other people, you know, see who won and ask for their winning proposals. Uh, recently I've done big surveys of who won various things. There was a microgrid proposal. I looked at everybody's um, uh, grant applications through a particular lens to see what won and didn't win. And, and actually to see how they laid things out even, to see what, you know, so that, for example, I went back to, to Momentum and said, you know, we need bios that all look the same. We look unprofessional. You know, you look at other people's things, you see how they've laid them out and what, what they've been doing, and ask for why you didn't win. And they, they are, because they've got those points, and um, always, the point system always asks for why you didn't score. And then two things, build additional phases. I've already talked about that. This was phase one. You're ready for phase two. You know, you, you have a good idea of what phase two and phase three are. This is one of those great things, you know, in 2018, you awarded us for phase one of this biodigester. And now we're coming back to you for phase two and you've performed well, you gave them the deliverables on time, and you know how to write the thing, you come back for phase two um, and you've got a lot of it already ready and you know it was successful the first time. Um, but don't be a grant junkie, please, please. I, I've seen so many people go, but we should win this even though it's not quite right. The square peg into the round hole doesn't work. They've got so many people who are square pegs into square square, square holes, or whatever they are, a square mm -hmm. hole. Um, they don't need you. You don't, you know, trying to fit into a grant that doesn't quite fit, don't bother. There's enough competition out there, you're not gonna win. Um, and don't be a grant chunky. Don't don't go, oh yeah, we we build biodigesters, but maybe we can make an electric car. That sounds cool. Uh, don't do that. It, you know, they know whether you can do things or not. And um, the things you can do now, and we've talked about a lot of them. First of all, we haven't talked about this, registrations. If your client or you haven't got registrations for DUNS and SAM.gov and grants.gov, do it tomorrow. Do me a favor. These things can be nightmares. SAM.gov is something that I've done about six times in recent months. I have no idea how I do it every time. None. It is the most obscure, Byzantine, bizarre system. I can see somebody grinning there. I have no idea who invented this system. Dunn's, which is the Dunn and Pat Smith <laughs> thing, is changing to Ernst & Young. So who knows what that's gonna be like. Do these things tomorrow. You know, if you've got a client, go and ask them, have you got a Dunn's number? Have you registered with grants.gov? Just look at those things. Um, get resumes and bios from your team. It's easy. If you know that you're going to be applying for grants, I mean, if you've got a managing director or a CEO, get a bio from them, for heaven's sake. Get a resume. Just get it now. Um, and preferably in Word so that you can mess with it. Um, if, you've got, if you know that you're going to get letters of support at some point from your, for your project, go to the people who you think you're going to ask and say, look, we think we're going to be asking for, you know, applying for funding for this, and we'd love to have a letter of support when the time comes. Warn them. Don't, you know, throw it at them three weeks before the thing is due. And assure them that you will always write a template. You'll hand them a template. I mean, that's how we got 50 for, for that recent grant, because 
we sent them a, a, a template and it, they all look the same, the letters. Sometimes we, you know, massage them, you know, one paragraph will be different. It doesn't matter that they're all the same as far as I can tell. Um, but they need to know that Diane Feinstein has, you know, taken the time to sign something and that the local city council member has taken the town to time. You know, they all support it, whether or not the words are the same or not. Um, if you do have a project partner, uh, you need to have a, a description. It's easy, um, it's easy now to get a description of who they are not the individuals, but the organization or the company. You might as well get a description of them. I've had to do this at the last minute for a lot of people. And a lot of the time, DC grants want to know five projects similar to the one that you are um, applying for, five projects that those partners have been involved in. So I've written, you know, little write-ups on, you know, plants in India, and, you know, whatever. But, you know, you need, you might as well do it now. Uh, contact the agencies, we've talked about that, socializing your project, making sure you've got matching funds and the matching fund partners knowing that they're gonna have to write a letter of commitment. Um, research agency strategic plans, which we touched on right at the beginning. Research whether your project is in a disadvantaged community and how you would socialize that project to a disadvantaged community. See whether you've got your permits, please. That can be the stickiest and most horrible piece of your entire application. And you might as well write a scope and budget. Just outline it. Know it. It's really useful to know, you know, from any business point of view, what the stages are and how much this is going to cost. And you can do all of those things in advance. And I think that's it. That's not me but those are our CEOs and people. I'm, uh, you have my business cards, so if you want to contact me or email me, or you have all my information. But are there any, um, any questions, any more questions? Or are you all trying to take in what I said? Mm -hmm. But you know, do email me if you have questions. I have no idea what the time is and whether we have three. Um, Three o'clock. All right. Case, were there any questions on the chat? Nope. Great. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for being first day of school and listening <laughs> to the event of okay. so, Thank you. I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, grant application itself, can you find videos, pictures, and whatnot? If you put room, because a lot of the time they'll say you have 35 pages for your narrative, we actually do suggest you put pictures and if you've got room, pictures and graphs, and it's something to break it up. Videos, no. They're not going to go to a video. So there, everything's going to be paper, paper, paper. Actually, no. It's electronic. Mostly, if you're, if, in, if you're incredibly unlucky, you're going to have to do paper. Mostly, it's online submissions these days. And actually, that is a point that I need to make to you. Always test out the online submission form before the last day. Do it right early. See if you need passwords, see if it works. I mean, I did one recently where it was Friday afternoon, it was East Coast time, it was horrible, it wasn't my fault, I promise you. But you know, I pressed a yes on this up submission form and it came up with all these questions that we had no idea were there. So you, you and it was, they were like demographics, they were things that had to be right. It was right, it was like, oh no. Press every button, Test everything out, um, very, very important. Mostly not paper, thank God, anymore, um, because paper is a nightmare. But no, videos aren't generally watched. Have you heard of the fast lane? Yeah. Would you care to comment on that? They're all horrible. Fast, fast I think, was actually the fast lane thing, was easier than some. What, what was your feeling on it? Well, when you mention pictures, uh, and, they're, and they have begun to change, and they have altered it dramatically in the last 18 months. Uh -huh. But prior to that, you know, they really didn't allow pictures. And, but if you had a program director that uh, was, but there were program directors uh, that did uh, allow pictures, but you had to know where they went under a different heading in order to get the pictures uploaded in and still have them connected to your your proposal. 
And that's the sort of thing you can ask on an F, you know, when they ask for questions, you can say, I want to, you know, submit a video or I want to, and there doesn't seem to be anywhere on your submission form for this. Where do you suggest I put it? But we like embedding pictures, you know, this is a picture of the, the facility that's going to be or whatever it is, if there's room. Well, they don't, they have the area where it's strictly print still. Oh. On, on, you know, you can only have characters in there. You can't have the pictures in with the text, which would be too much like uh, a, uh, a logical, yeah. persuasive presentation. You have to have those in a different spot. And then the question I had, which still wasn't answered, they have reviewers that review these. And the program director would be able to see the entire proposal, but he gets to make the decision as to what he gives to the reviewers, which in one case, he gave them uh, the uh, strictly the print, the dry stuff, which really wouldn't have, yeah, it would have been boring for somebody that was even an expert in the area. It's very difficult. I mean, and, and you know, we've written millions and mil you know, millions of submissions. And I know, you know, just a few months ago, um, one of our writers was saying, hey, do you know where we can put this thing that wasn't strictly print? And we had a lot of backwards and forwards about it. it it's complicated and you don't want it to be disregarded. If you put it in the wrong place, it's gonna not be seen. You know, just like you're saying. So you have to be careful and you have to, if you can possibly ask the agency itself, where is this, where can I put this in order to make it absolutely be seen? <clears throat> sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. So you represent, excuse me, you represent a professional momentum, our movement takes momentum, is a grant writing. And other things, yes, yeah, strategic planning, fund development. And so uh, you're, you're a service organization with a fee attached. Absolutely. And then what about for the do-it-yourselfers, which yeah. they are more now like uh, the California seed funding. Uh, see, yeah. and this rocket fund out of uh, 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 Caltech. Well, CalSeed is particularly aimed at people doing it themselves. They've tried to make the um, application form as simple as possible so people do not have to spend A, time, and B, money on hiring anyone else to do it. It's meant to be, right. it's meant to be a simple process. But in the debriefing, I was basically told that what was lacking were these professional, like it says on there, they don't want any letters of recommendation. Right. And then I'm turned down or I'm passed over because I'm told that I had no letters of recommendation attached. Well, that's very, very strange. That shouldn't happen. I would say I'm on the review board for Seed. I don't review the ones that come from our region, but I review um, Bay Area applications. Yeah, and so mine coming from here being reviewed by the Bay Area, which uh, there are a lot of reviewers out of Oakland, and I came to the Valley mm -hmm. way too long ago from Oakland. When, and Oakland now has become a renaissance center. And I know where these office buildings are where these people are being housed. Yeah, I but, don't know if it's necessarily Oakland. I think part of it is from some of our sister partner organizations. So I don't know if the reviewers are from Oakland. I don't think they are from CalSIP necessarily. They're from- Not at all, actually. No, they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, they're all over. Uh, and well, it's, And it's, it's a handful of people that's a technical review, but I only review team. And if I think that the grant proposal can be met within the time frame and the budget that's put in there. Yes. Because I've never seen one attached letter of industry recommendations. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, that sounds like a particular case and it mm -hmm. sounds odd. But, you know, generally speaking, they should hold by the rules that they, that they say. Yeah. But either way, I mean, it's hard to, to comment on the particular. Is there a listing of these uh, groups like, uh, uh, cradle, has anyone in here heard of Cradle to Cradle? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. Out of Oakland, uh, they get they get hired in to review some things, and the Desert Research Institute out of Nevada, they're reviewing some of this stuff. But they also are. It's kind of I think of it as a conflict of interest, 
and yeah i mean that's a i mean you know that's beyond my scope basically you know i don't know how they work those people we just try to play the system as we understand it and you know generally speaking i believe that um certainly agencies i've worked with try very hard to be neutral because they can be questioned mm -hmm. but the the idea the do-it-yourself guys uh that you're in the area you were mentioning one to five million dollar grants and the, the do-it-yourself which you know is mm -hmm. like uh, 250,000 is a big bunch but the cal seed they say up to 600,000 but it starts out with something at less than 100,000 yeah. and as someone at the federal uh, highway administration told me uh, caltrans looks at the requirements under uh, the uh, Transportation Research Board. Has anyone in here ever submitted to the uh, Transportation Research, uh, the National Academy of Sciences? Oh, a long time ago. They said that, then they quoted to me that with my partnering or having Caltrans as a partner, it was going nowhere because the most that they would allow uh, was, uh, and Caltrans knew it was like $40,000 and Caltrans themselves made the comment that, uh, and this is coming back to me from the Fed guy, he's saying Caltrans doesn't even want our money because they look at it as finding pennies in a couch. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can't, I, I, unfortunately, Hella and I have to go on to yeah. Vegas Field right now, but it's very difficult to answer particular things about stuff I don't know about. But, but you, you understand, I, I mean, you, you're, in, you're uh, sensitive to what I'm speaking of, maybe. Yes, but I think there's so many different so, parts to it, so I don't. I'll, I'll let this gentleman over here, he had a question. Well, mine was, uh, do you have a business card before you leave? Yeah, they're all out there, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, okay. Courtney will give you one. Have you ever worked with Native American tribes? And as partners, I've never had them as an applicant to a grant. But as people who are partners or in a team, yes, not, not ever as the applicant. Is there a reason for that? No, no. I'm just thinking. So, in other words, yeah, I was just can the grant money be used on uh, Indian uh, when we were speaking of the property aspect? You don't know of any reason that. that uh, through your deal that the, that you, in other words, that the Indian reservation, I would call them in construction like the prime, but they don't own, the land that they own is tribal land. Would that be a reason that they couldn't use certain it, funds? You know, that all depends on who you're asking, who the grant is from. You have to, as Janet mentioned, just read through all the yeah, I, takes I in there, and, and then also, if it is the tribe, you need to make sure that the tribe has agreed to this being happening on their land. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Janet, for everything. Thank you, Julie.